Welcome to the Migration Policy Institute. Great to have you here. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Seely. I'm president of the Migration Policy Institute. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of both MPI and, and PRB. Um, we are doing this event together. Um, you are at the event Immigration Data Matters, How to Find the Most Accurate Resources. This is sort of like that announcement on when you get on the air, you know, the airplane and they say, you know, this is the flight to Anchorage. If you're not going to Anchorage, you know, this is your time to get off. If that was not the event you were coming to, of course, um, this is the Immigration Data Matters event. Um, great to have you with us. Um, and we both have a fabulous audience here in person. Um, still a few people arriving and you can feel free to come in and take seats as you come in. Um, and we also have people uh, attending by a live stream. And so welcome to everyone that is live streaming this, um, who is going to be part of this conversation. There are several people, you, several ways you can participate. Those of you that are live streaming, you can tweet questions at us at, at migration policy. That again is at migration policy. Um, you can also use the hashtag MPI discuss. And if you were tweeting live from within the room, feel free to use that as well, of course. Um, hashtag MPI discuss. Um, and if you are live streaming, you can email us questions to events at migrationpolicy.org. Again, events at migrationpolicy.org. We will, of course, take questions from here in the room once we get to that. But we also want to make sure that those who are live streaming us, who are attending from around the country and around the world, can participate actively as well. Um, and finally, we are releasing a guide today. Um, and you can find it online at migrationpolicy.org slash data matters. Again, migrationpolicy.org data matters. Um, we have a fabulous group of speakers today. I will introduce them more fully before each of them speak, but just very quickly, Jana Badalova, my colleague, the senior policy analyst and the, the manager of the data hub here at MPI. Um, we have, uh, as well, Mark Mather, the associate vice president of US programs at the Population Reference Bureau. Mark, great to have you here, and thanks for everything for the partnership with PRB in this project. Um, Liz Grieco, Elizabeth Grieco, is um, now with the, the uh, she's a senior writer and editor at the Pew Research Center and a former chief of the Foreign Born Population Branch at the U.S. Census Bureau and was at DHS at one point as well. And most importantly, was also with MPI yes. many, many years ago. So great to have you back in this conference room. Good to be here. And many of you know Mark Rosenblum, Deputy Assistant Secretary and Director of the Office of Immigration Statistics um, at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, man of many accomplishments, including uh, an important uh, period of time with the Congressional Research Service, working in the Senate, and again, most importantly, working at Migration Policy Institute as well. So Mark, good to have you back here. Um, this is a guide that both MPI and PRB have created together. Um, it's something that we've done with the support of the Annie Casey Foundation. Thank you to the Annie Casey Foundation for their support. And we're particularly glad to do this because for us at MPI, one of our commitments is making sure that people have good quality data on, on immigration. People can access um, know where to go. We often process this data. You can actually go to our data hub. You will see lots of things that we've done, which Jana runs, um, that where we try and actually work with data and give you answers to some of the key questions you may have. But we also want you to be able to go in and, and ask your own questions and answer them by using the data. And this is our attempt to really make sure that you know where websites are, what are the data sources out there where you can run your own data. Um, so we're, PRB does very similar things. Mark will talk about this later. PRB is very committed also to making sure that people have good access to quality data. But for both of our institutions, that really is at, at one of the central things that we try and do to really enlighten the immigration debate. Um, you might be interested in going to our Migration Data Hub. It actually does have a lot of process data as well as, as information back on where to go. But hopefully with this resource, you can also go in and run, run your own um, do your, do your own research on this. Um, let me turn this over to Jana, who has been the lead on our side on data matters. And um, Jana is a, a woman of many accomplishments. Um, she uh, runs, as said a couple of times, the data hub here. She writes frequently in, in uh, the immigration, our migration source. She's a senior policy analyst. She is the author of Skilled Immigrant and Native Workers in the United States, published in 2006. And she holds a PhD in sociology with a specialization in demography from the University of California, Irvine. So, Jana. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So glad to have you here with us in, in the room as well as online. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. Um, I'm very glad to be here with my former colleagues, Liz, Mark. I like them very much as people, and uh, I also respect you as data geeks. So <laughs> glad to be on the panel. Um, I'm also very happy to be here and co-present with Mark from PRB back in 2008. We launched this little publication, and it was downloaded more than two million times. Um, 
Um, and was I surprised by uh, the reaction? Well, yes or no? I wish that we charged a dollar per download. We <laughs> <laughs> all retired by now. Um, but it also, to us, reaffirmed the, the value of data, the value of, of sharing uh, high quality, uh, a credible, recent data with, uh, with uh, a growing audience. So I've been with MBI for about 13 years. And over this during this time, I spoke with I know, hundreds of uh, people who reached out to us about a statistic uh, on, about immigrants in the United States or immigration trends in, in other countries. And I have to say that the data needs and the kinds of people who are reaching out to us have changed quite a bit during uh, the time I've been here. Um, so we used to get calls uh, from people who wanted to get kind of top line statistics, um, how many Dominican immigrants reside in New York City, or how many Indian H-1B workers arrived last year. Um, so the majority of people who called us, they were either journalists, uh, or service providers, or graduate students who were rushing to turn in their research papers by 5 o'clock that day. Um, and as immigration gained more prominence in political debates and it became embedded in daily conversations, um, we started receiving more numerous calls, uh, more complex calls, people from more sophisticated audiences, and also a broader range of uh, callers. Uh, just recently, I got an email from um, a curator in a museum in uh, Brea, which is a, a city in Southern California with 42,000 people, so not very, not not a big city, but uh, uh, who wanted to learn about immigration trends in her city sin, since 1920. Mm. So interest in local data and historic data. We also get calls from real estate companies interested about Americans and Canadians moving to Mexico and uh, Costa Rica for retirement. So international uh, movements in multiple directions. Um, uh, we, a colleague of mine and I had a conversation with uh, um, a gentleman from Africa who's here, started an investment firm, and wants to uh, develop financial services for African immigrants with the goal to promote um, uh, development in, in home countries. So very interested in data about uh, who the African immigrants are, where they are, how well they're doing, and how to target financial services to them. And last fall, um, someone from the Montgomery, Montgomery County of um, uh, County Board of Education reached out uh, to us uh, looking for data about DACA eligible youth in that particular county. So again, the the, the more localized data than before. Uh, my favorite example is the message I got from. Uh, a classmate of mine from high school that was in Moldova many years ago, uh, whose own high school daughter, they now live in New York City, was writing an essay and she was citing the data from the Migration um, uh, Data Hub. And I was, of course, very pleased because uh, mm -hmm. when we manage you know, and compile the data, we want everyone to use it. And so even high school kids are now um, interested in immigration and citing the data from us. And plus, thanks to technology and investment in data visualization, uh, we have now more and more data on various aspects of immigration. Um, and that's great. They're fun to, to use, easy to use, very visual, uh, although not always well uh, explained and defined. So this guide aims to reflect these diverse needs and new opportunities. And it directs users to most credible uh, and recent data on immigrants and um, uh, immigration trends in the US and uh, internationally. We included um, about 220 resources. Um, and I have to say up front that, uh, so I should move here. Uh, I have to say up front that the, 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 the guide does not represent an exhaustive list of all possible uh, resources. But these are the resources that we turn again and again in our, in our own work. And I'd like to thank all of my colleagues at MPI for sharing their secret data sources uh -huh. and, and sharing their data blues, which we try to address too. So what exactly will you get here? Um, as direct access to data tables and charts, 
um, uh, data sources that we include uh, include government agencies such as DHS and the Census Bureau, um, international organizations such as the UN Population Division and the World Bank, uh, interactive tools and maps and data sets uh, put together by reputable research organizations and universities. The guide covers um, a wide range of uh, topics from population stocks and flows uh, to sociodemographic characteristics of immigrants and their children, international students, uh, enforcement statistics, religious affiliation, um, public opinion, development education uh, indicators, and, and many more. Um, the data are, uh, are often updated at uh, uh, various levels of geography, so we flag that in the data a guide where it's relevant. The, the data guides itself is free to use, uh, either I guess in the hard copy or online, and so are the data resources that we uh, included. Um, we hope that the audience will be uh, broad from people looking for a quick stat or map uh, to those who are willing and interested in um, uh, digging deeper into the data. We plan to go back periodically and update the guide, fix the broken, broken links, um, and also maybe uh, 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 make some other updates. So if you have a great data resource, uh, please drop us a line at uh, data at migrationpolicy.org, and we'll be uh, very glad to consider including it. Let me just very quickly show you two examples on how to get, how to use the guide. Um, so let's say you are interested in comparing earnings of immigrants and uh, the U.S. born uh, workers in the U.S. If you do a search uh, in this guide, it's a PDF um, file on the term earnings. One of the data resources is the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, resource. Um, in the middle column, you will find what we offer. Uh, I mean, what this guide. Um, with this, what this source will contain and how often the data are updated. And um, uh, in, in, in a number of uh, data sources, we included tips. Uh, so how will you get from the landing page to the exact table that you are looking for? So if you click on this link, you will land on this top line more uh, navigation page. But with the if you follow the steps that we outlined in the tips, uh, uh, in the tip section, you will get to that table that shows the um, weekly earnings uh, by age. If you scroll down, there will be also by um, Hispanic origin and other characteristics. And if you are interested in asylum trends in the European Union, uh, the, uh, the Eurostat will be, uh, which is the statistical office of the European Union, will be the key data source. And let me tell you, you can spend hours on this um, uh, data-rich website. So we included a more direct link uh, to the uh, uh, section that covers asylum and migration data. And in particular here, you will get asylum application and decision data over time by applicants' uh, citizenship, uh, age and sex. And you can download both as a, um, you know Excel file and then do your own uh, analysis. MPI also has um, some uh, uh, asylum-related data for the European Union. So if you click on that link, you'll get uh, to... Um, this heat map that shows uh, uh, application uh, recognition rates in countries of destination within the European, in the European Union uh, by country of origin uh, over time. So that will give you a quick map. Uh, so I trust that um, uh, I gave you enough information in my eight or nine, nine minutes and uh, to get you going. Thank you. Looking forward to the rest of the session. Thank you, Jana. Let me also acknowledge Michelle Middlestadt, who's actually back there, is also one of the report authors, by the way. So, Michelle, good to have you here. Um, and let me turn it over to Mark now, actually. Mark, you're going to talk a little bit about uh, resources related to children. And you can, yes. Uh, and thank you again for all your views work on this. Sure. Thank you. Uh, actually, in full disclosure, uh, I didn't have to do much of the work in producing this guide. Jana and her team did uh, 
95% of the work. So, um, but I can tell you having helped with the review and copy editing is there's a lot of resources in there. So I hope everyone finds it useful. Uh, I'm going to provide, I'm Mark Mother, I'm with the Population Reference Bureau. I'm going to provide kind of a quick uh, big picture overview of census data on children and immigrant families. And so that's really what we focus on at PRB. Through our work with the NE Casey Foundation, uh, we're mostly working on uh, kids' issues and, and Im kids and immigrant families is obviously one of the key uh, population subgroups. So that's uh, one of the, uh, the core areas for us. So um, four topics I want to cover very quickly. First of all, why should we be looking at this particular subgroup of the population? Who are kids and immigrant families and where do they live? I'll talk a little bit about data definitions and data gaps, and then a couple of words about the Casey Foundation's Kids Count Project, where you can go to get uh, lots of good data on the well-being of kids living in immigrant families. So why should we care about this particular group? Well, um, first of all, they are one of the fastest growing segments of the child population. So uh, in the next few years, in the next decade, they're going to be populating the labor force and also changing the uh, racial ethnic composition of both the population and the labor force. So it's an important group in, in that respect. Um, there's also very important regional and state differences. So it's, not, it's often not enough just to look at what's happening at the national level because there's so much variation at uh, the subnational level. And so I'll, I'll get in, into that a little bit. And then um, the fact that they have very unique policy and programmatic needs. So I know there's a lot of debate and discussion right now about DACA and uh, kids being separated from their parents. Um, but there's, this is a large and growing population. And um, many of the, the kids in these families are simply flying under the radar. So there's lots of other issues that aren't getting addressed in the news reports and that we need to, really need to be paying attention to. This is how we define kids and immigrant families in, um, at PRB, and it's from the American Community Survey that we do that. I don't, there's no universal definition, so I think other groups may differ a little bit in how they define it. But uh, for our purposes with the Casey Foundation, it's kids under age 18 who are either foreign-born themselves or who live with at least one foreign-born parent. And if you see that footnote there, uh, I know there's been a lot of recent um, migration from Puerto Rico to the States. All of those kids would be classified as living in U.S.-born families, so just so you know. So here are some numbers. These are data showing the number, uh, the, the rise in the number of kids living in immigrant families from about 8.3 million in 1990 up to over 18 million in 2016. Over that same time period, the share of kids living in immigrant families increased from about 13% to 25%. So as of 2016, it's about one fourth of all kids in the US who are living uh, in immigrant families. And what's really driving this is um, historical trends in immigration. So uh, most immigrants, when they come to the United States, they tend to be young, they're coming here to work, they're of reproductive age, so they arrive here and many start families. And so that's what leads to what demographers call population momentum. Lots of young families having, having babies, and that's what's leading to this rapid growth. So as a result of this growth, we're also seeing pretty rapid substantial change in the racial ethnic composition of the child population. These are data showing the uh, distribution of kids from 1980 to 2016, and then looking ahead to 2030, the, the share of kids in, in each racial ethnic group. Those blue bars represent the share of kids who are non-Hispanic whites. So that has dropped from 73% in 1980, a generation ago, down to just over half in 2016. Uh, there were new population projections that actually just came out last week from the Census Bureau that show that the child population is projected to become so-called majority minority by 2020. And then by 2030, uh, less than half, about 47% of these, these kids are projected to be uh, non-Hispanic white. Those green bars in this chart are Latinos, so that's really been the fastest growing group, the one that's really been driving a lot of this change although we've also seen substantial increase in um, Asian American population growth in recent years. 
So uh, as of 2016, 25% of all kids in the U.S. are uh, classified by, as let, Hispanic or Latino. Now, among immigrant kids, it's important to note that there's a lot of uh, variation, diversity within that group. So this shows the breakdown uh, among kids in immigrant families who are in different racial ethnic groups. So it is over half Hispanic Latino and 17% Asian American. So 70% right there, just in those two groups. But we are, we're also seeing a pretty rapid increase in the share of kids and families who are arriving from Africa and the Caribbean. So we're seeing rapid growth as well in the, in the share of these ch children and youth who are, who are black or African American. There's also uh, higher concentrations of these uh, kids in certain parts of the country. I'm sure you, you, you all know that. Uh, California has the highest share of children in immigrant families. Close to half of all kids in that state are in immigrant families, about 47%. We also see um, high shares in Nevada, New York, New Jersey, and uh, other states in the South. Uh, we tend to see much lower shares in the upper Midwest, parts of Appalachia, and the Deep South. Well, and there's only uh, two states that over the past 10 years, from 2006 to 2016, that saw a decline in the share of kids and immigrant families. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to which two states those are? It's Arizona and California. So... Uh, just to give you a sense of the diversity of this group in a different way, these are this chart shows child poverty rates broken down for kids in immigrant families, those are the blue bars, and kids in U.S.-born families, those are the orange bars. And we looked at the, that breakdown for different racial ethnic groups. So the total there shows in the first uh, two bars that, that kids in immigrant families are more likely to be poor than kids in U.S.-born families. However, if you look across different racial ethnic groups, you see that there's actually a lot of diversity there. So that for uh, black children, for Asian American children, and for kids in that other and multiracial group, poverty rates are actually higher for kids in U.S. born families relative to uh, children in immigrant families. So now just to talk a few minutes about the the data sources. I mentioned that we use the American Community Survey primarily at, at the Population Reference Bureau. Current Population Survey is also a source that many people use, especially to look at, at national trends. But the, the real benefit of the ACS is that it has this very large sample size, so it, it's, it really works well for our work with the Casey Foundation. They want to look at variation across the states. So it's got a large sample size. It provides access to pretty reliable data at the state level and for different population subgroups within uh, the immigrant child population. It's also very timely. So we now have access to 2016 ACS one-year estimates. And starting this fall, we'll have access to new 2017 data. So those data are released every year. The challenge is, is uh, one is that you, you often need statistical software to get the data that you need. So Census Bureau has a uh, public use microdata sample or PUMS data file that uh, we often use to look at this, this population group. Um, with the PUMS, with those microdata, data are not available for very small geographic areas. So you can typically produce them for states or for these so-called public use microdata areas or PUMAs. But you're not going to be able to get data for small counties using the, the microdata files. And then uh, the one benefit of the CPS over the ACS is that the CPS does include child parent pointers on the file. So it allows you to easily link kids to their parents living in the household. Since the ACS lacks that pointer, it's a little more complicated to construct the programs to look at parental characteristics, and especially to get information about kids living in complex living arrangements. So um, I already gave a definition for kids in immigrant families. These are all of the different categories of kids that we put into, that are, that are grouped into that, um, the kids in immigrant families, those first five categories. Um, so any child who is living with parents where um, all of the parents in the household are U.S. born and the child is U.S. born, that 
that child is classified as living in a, a U.S. born family. And then if the child is born in the U.S. and does not live with either parent, we also class, classify that child as living in a U.S. born family. And then everyone else gets grouped into that, that other category of immigrant families. So I mentioned the Kids Count project. Um, Kids Count Data Center is a great resource if you haven't used it. Uh, there are data available for the 50 states, for DC, Puerto Rico, and for many large cities. Uh, data are generally available back to 2000 to the present for each year. And they include more than 20 indicators for children and immigrant families. So I put the web address up here at datacenter.kidscount.org, but if you just Google Kids Count Data Center, that website should pop right up. And I know you'll have trouble reading this, but this is just to give you a sense that there are a lot of indicators available there. And so, um, and the nice thing is that it allows you to compare the well-being of kids and immigrant families with kids and U.S. born families on uh, measures of education and poverty and other, and other dimensions of well-being. So it's a, it's a really good resource in that it gets you these detailed crosstabs by state and for these large cities. And then finally, um, I'd encourage you to, if you're interested in policy, I encourage you to look at the Casey Foundation's 2017 Race for Results report. Uh, that's a state-by-state -state analysis of how kids are doing in each state. But this particular report focused on kids and immigrant families. So uh, PRB helped them produce the data for this, and then they wrote up a really nice summary of um, some of the key issues that kids and immigrants are facing, kid kids and immigrant families are facing, and some of the strategies that can be used to help them succeed. So, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, and Mark, I didn't give you a full introduction, but in addition to being the Associate Vice President of U.S. Programs at Population Reference Bureau, say he's the author of 40 publications and widely cited in the press, New York Times, uh, U.S. News and World Report, uh, Associated Press, The Wall Street Journal, and he holds a PhD from the University of Maryland. So, great. If you're here, and let me turn now to Liz Greco. Uh, Elizabeth Greco is a senior writer editor at the Pew Research Center, um, where she focuses on journalism and media research. Um, but she has a long uh, history on immigration research um, at the U.S. Census Bureau and the Department of Homeland Security and at MPI before that. Mm -hmm. um, and she has a Ph.D. in sociology and demography from Florida State University and recently went back and got a master's degree in interactive journalism at American University as well. So Liz, good to have you back here. Thank you. Thank you. It's very happy to be here. I want to congratulate MPI on the new Data Matters. This is gorgeous. I'm so happy. I was here years and years ago when we first did the first first version of this, I think back in 2004, wasn't it? Um, it didn't look like this. It wasn't quite as, as extensive. What I like about this publication is that it's great for if people who really know their stuff about immigration data. But what I really, really, really like about this publication is it's great for people who are new to the immigration data area. I love the way it's laid out because you can just flip through, you know, the, you've got the data, or you've got the, the text in red, which give you broad categories, and then each of the, uh, of each of the um, boxes um, where you can really zoom in on what you're looking for, and it would help new people take their first steps into a world that is very, very complex, and it takes, unfortunately, it takes years to master, but this is a really good road roadmap, so I commend MPI for this, uh, this beautiful publication. I'd also like to thank MPI for the invitation uh, to come talk, as, as um, Andrew mentioned. I am now at the Pew Research Center uh, as a senior writer editor on the journalism team, but in my past life, I worked at DHS OIS, Office of Immigration Statistic, Statistics, as a senior demographer and at the Census Bureau as the chief of the Foreign Born Population Branch and as the original data manager, manager for the original Migration Information Source team many years ago too many to mention, and also as a senior demographer at MPI where I was able to um, do a lot of my research um, in, on, on various um, aspects of, of the foreign born and the migration process. So I've, it's an, I'm, I'm unusual because I've gotten to work as a data provider in the sense that I've worked at um, making sure that data are the best they can be and getting them out there so other people can use the data and do the research they want as well as an analyst myself using these various uh, um, data sources to uh, put out information and, and publications of, of my own. So I think I've been very blessed with a kind of an odd career, but it's, but it's been fun nonetheless. 
Uh, so the data matters, the immigration data matters is such a beautiful resource. It brings tears to my eyes. It's so good. Uh, but you know, all, all jesting aside, it, it's it's really hard to criticize something something this good and this comprehensive. So given my background, um, I thought it might be useful to talk briefly about data gaps that, that still exist, specifically in the US statistical um, system in which I have um, <coughs> my um, most experience. So I'm going to talk a little bit about data gaps in regards to the foreign-born population and the immigration process. Um, um, I see the world as a demographer. I see the world in stocks and flows. So um, I will talk about both of those briefly and also highlight a few unsung heroes that I think um, don't get the um, attention they need and also the um, some underutilized resources that I want to, that I want to uh, go ahead and um, emphasize. So it's good, it's up. So this is the first slide. It is a very, very simple graph of the foreign born in the United States. And the idea here is to show that the stock data can really be divided into citizens and non-citizens, and the non-citizens can be divided up into these um, broad uh, migration statuses, including legal permanent residents, non-immigrants, the unauthorized uh, refugees, and asylees. So what we measure well with the av available data is the total foreign-born population and the size and characteristics of two legal statuses. This is citizens and non-citizens. That is the only thing you're going to get from the American Community Survey, the Current Population Survey, and older decennial censuses. So we have a lot of information, a, a wealth of information on these two legal statuses all the way down to the low, lowest levels of, of geography. So I think we're set there. Now what we don't do really well are, are measuring the other immigration statuses. Uh, the first two I want to talk about are the legal permanent resident population and the non-immigrant population. There is no survey data out there where we can go and see, you know, get estimates of the count of these populations or their characteristics. However, we do have stock estimates generated by the Office of Immigration Statistics based on their administrative data of various sources. And this is one of those unsung heroes I want to, to mention. OAS generates these annual population estimates, and I really think they don't get the attention they deserve. Because, and I think people really see them, they don't give them the importance that these reports, reports deserve because they're really the only estimates of the size of these, these populations that we have. And so I commend OIS for doing these to begin with, and I hope they continue to do them and improve them, and I'm sure Mark will be talking a little bit about them as well. But they are really that important, given what we have in, in, in the stock data world. Um, another status we don't really measure well is the unauthorized population. You would think we would, given all the estimates out there. Uh, but we really don't have any survey data on the unauthorized population. We have stock estimates generated by the OIS. Um, Pew Research does um, them as well. MPI, I believe, does them as well. Uh, CIS, uh, Center, for, Center for Immigration Studies, other people up in New York, the group I, um, CMS. thank you, CMS. And there's others that, that do this, but they're all based on a combination of census and administrative data. So I think we do a, a good job of developing the estimates based on the data we have available, but they require a lot of modeling and assumptions to get these estimates. And anytime you have assumptions in models, it kind of makes me nervous because they can be influenced and tweaked by all sorts of things, and that's not always the best way to develop estimates, but on the flip side, it's what we have, and it's the estimates that we produce. Um, we also have the refugee and asylee population. There, the State Department, I believe, if I remember correctly, um, used to do estimates of stock a while ago. Is that correct, Michelle? I mean, do they still do them? I'm not sure if they still do them or not. Um, but I know I'm not going to steal Mark's thunder. He's going to have a little bit of an update about possible estimates of the refugee and asylee population, so I'll leave that to Mark to talk about. So when we look at data overall, stock data overall in the United States, I don't think we do too bad. I mean, I think we are very fortunate to have the ACS and the decennial census and the current population 
uh, compared to what other countries have. I think we are very blessed to have this information. But there are, you know, there's our data gaps that we are, um, there are information that we'd like to have more and that are especially important for policy making decisions. Uh, one of them is the uh, size and characteristics of the recent arrivals. Here I mean um, immigrants that have come within the last year or so. One of the things I did last year was publish a data note in the International Migration Review with my colleagues Luke Larson and Howard Hogan, both at the Census Bureau still, um, on the reasons why you cannot use the ACS to estimate recent arrivals. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. If you're wondering why, go ahead and look up the um, the data data note on in, in, in the International Migration Review. It has to do with the way the data are collected, and so you cannot use it for the estimate of the size of the recent arrival population. Um, and we can you know talk about that later if you want. Um, another area that I think is important, and and this sort of speaks to what Mark and the his work on immigrant children. There's a lot of integration. Um, assimilation, whatever the current word is now, that doesn't offend people. But the idea that um, you've got folks here that are going to immigrate or integrate into the local um, culture. And so they're, they're, I think immigrate, integration is really the, an area that we need to start focusing more on. Um, one thing I think is interesting is the concept of dual or multiple citizenship. We just don't really have good data on that. Um, we also don't have um, any data on return migrants. I just think that's an interesting population that we really can't say anything about. Are these people coming back because, you know, they're, they're coming back to, to take a job again at the same place they were before? Are they part of the international immigration uh, class that just moves around a lot? We don't know. I think it'd be interesting to um, learn more about return migrants. And a topic that is, that it, that is, related to stock, but isn't quite a stock topic, is the coverage of the foreign born in our um, census season surveys. So this speaks to um, how accurately, the, say, the ACS or the current population include um, migrants in the sample and how well migrants are covered. Are they missed? Are they overcovered, et cetera? Um, we have no good estimate of, co of coverage of the foreign born. And there are a lot of assumptions made about coverage, and some I agree with and some I strongly disagree with. Um, but the fact is we don't have um, um, estimates of coverage, and I think this has um, implications for uh, down the line of, of, with the, re the research we do, especially on the unauthorized. Um, so one of the, another unsung hero or uh, utilized, unutil underutilized resource is an article by Eric Jensen and his colleagues at the Census Bureau that look at estimates of the coverage of the foreign born and the ACS. What they did is they looked at the Census 2000 data and they took the very first file of the ACS called the uh, C2SS, uh, Census 2000, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's the C2SS files. And it's probably the best work on coverage available. This is a 2015 population division working paper and it's probably the most data-based estimates on coverage that we have available. So if you are using or making assumptions in your models about coverage, I strongly urge you to take a look at that um, article. Um, another um, last thing I want to talk about was stock data. Unfortunately, we don't, we do have data on the second generation and children of immigrants um, from the current population survey and a little bit from the ACS but we don't have the data down to the local level where we really, really need to study um, what's happening with immigrant integration, immigrant assimilation, um, however you want to say that. Uh, the CPS data, remember, I think, unfortunately, I think the CPS data is sort of overlooked now because we have the American Community Survey data, which is a much larger file. But remember, we have second generation data, we have parental place of birth questions on the CPS. You can, like we do with the ACS, combine these um, files to create period estimates. So please, um, enterprising young graduate students out there, please don't forget you could do that if you are interested in studying the second generation. It isn't easy, but there's people at the Census Bureau, I'm sure, that would be um, willing to help you figure out exactly how to do that. Um, as Mark mentioned, he does use uh, the ACS to, uh, talk, to analyze children of immigrants in immigrant households. Um, two data source or two quick data sources out there that if you 
aren't necessarily someone who can download the data yourself and, and, and run SAS programs or SPSS programs or STATA or R or whatever is used now. Um, the American Fact Finder has two uh, data uh, tables, standard data tables, the B05009 and B05010. These will give you instant um, information about children, immigrant and native children in immigrant households uh, in tabular format that you can access right away and, and go ahead and get. Um, okay, so we move on to, uh, want to move on to the flow angle of my talk. Um, this second slide is a graph of the immigration process. It's not an octopus, it's a graph of, graph of the immigration process. Uh, the first column uh, to the left show the different immigration statuses in which people arrive, who, when they arrive in the United States, they come in these immigration statuses. So this includes legal permanent or resident arrivals, uh, non-immigrant temporary admissions, refugees, including asylee dependents, unauthorized entrants, these would be the border crossers, and returning immigrants, people who were here at one time in the past and came and left and came back. The second column are different immigrant statuses in which immigrants are in when they reside in the United States. This includes uh, naturalized citizens, uh, legal permanent resident arrivals. These are the new arrivals, or traditionally what we call immigrants. Uh, the legal permanent resident adjustees. These are folks that were in other statuses that adjusted to legal permanent resident status in the United States. Um, Non-immigrants, or what we call temporary admissions, refugees, asylees. We have the border crossers, the unauthorized border crossers, as well as unauthorized overstayers. And the final column would be uh, the status they take when they leave the United States. They can be, they can permanently leave the United States and become permanent immigrants, or they can become, uh, eventually become long-term re-immigrants if they come back in years later. Now the point here is to show graphically a rather complex process. Uh, people arrive in one status, they change statuses, they leave the country, they come back in on a different status, they become a citizen, you know, they might be a, a dual citizen. There's a lot of churning going on, and it is a not an easy process to measure. I don't want anyone to think that at all. This is a very difficult process to measure, um, and um, I think the graph shows that. So what I think we measure reasonably well, and this is with the, predominantly with the DHS administrative data, are the number of legal arrivals. These are the legal permanent residents that come in, the non-immigrants that come in, the refugees. All these people come in legally. Uh, we also estimate fairly well the number of adjustments to LPR status and the number of naturalizations by people who have who've obtained legal permanent resident status. We do a pretty good job with the non-immigrant departure. There's some, um, some limitations to that, which Mark may mention. And uh, we do pretty good with the number of asylee adjustments. Now, what we don't do really well or we don't measure at all are um, status change. We have limited immigration, limited information on status change. We do a pretty good job knowing when someone who, has a legal, who is in a legal permanent residence status becomes a naturalized citizen. But we don't do so well, for example, when one non-immigrant switches to a non-immigrant status. So when a student becomes an H-1B, we may or may not be able to, to see that very well. I know improvements have been made, and Mark is going to talk about those. About those. I'm really looking forward to hearing that. Um, we have the similar problem with unauthorized flow estimates and unauthorized entrance in general. Um, there have been some improvements made of um, information about Unauthorized overstayers. This is limited, but again, Mark will talk about that a little bit, and I'm interested in hearing more about that as well. Uh, one of the significant gaps, at least I think is a significant gap, is the fact that we don't have a lot of information on immigrants. We don't have any characteristics data, and we really don't have a count. And so we can't develop a rate of immigration. And this is significant for um, something I'll be talking about in, in, a, in a moment. And then, of course, my favorite population, the number of returning immigrants. Um, obviously, these are two populations that are just less important to the process and to documenting the process that, uh, that we have for DHS. But unfortunately, it, it causes a problem, So, um, which I'll talk about in a second. So I think we do a good job overall. Um, this is both in the stock, 
stock area and in the flow area. And as I said before, I think we are blessed to be in this country, to have the data sources at these at our disposal, and to be able to have and have a government that makes them fairly readily available to analysts to do their own research. But we do have gaps, and the gaps have consequences. I think the best example of uh, possible consequences is when we develop unauthorized estimates. Our unauthorized estimates, which, by the way, everyone who do, almost everyone who does unauthorized estimates and publishes them uses the same data sources and the same methods. So that's why you get very similar uh, final numbers, 11 to 12 million. Uh, but one or two of the things that the unauthorized estimates rely on and are very influenced by are our estimates of emigration, how many people, how many foreign-born actually leave the United States each year, and also our estimates of coverage, how well the Census Bureau does covering uh, uh, the foreign-born pop population in their censuses and surveys. A lot of these estimates are back of the envelope. Uh, makes me nervous, but when you have no data on these topics and you need them to make um, and when you need them to model the data and to, to make these estimates, you have to do it somehow. Uh, one of the things I, I, I have to give a shout out to uh, Mike Hafer and Nancy Raitina, who years ago, after they developed the um, estimates, the, the unauthorized estimates for OIS and developed the method that they were going to use annually, they developed a, uh, they had a population, or they, they had a, I think it was a PA paper, where they took their, their estimates for the year and they showed graphically what would happen if they put their estimates on a, of, 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 of coverage up or down and if they took their estimates of emigration and moved it up or down. It is very sensitive. The estimates of the unauthorized population are very sensitive to our assumptions of emigration and coverage. And so I want to commend the Office of Immigration Statistics once again for being very transparent when they put out their estimates when they're allowed to put out their estimates, um, we can, um, you can see in the back exactly the assumptions they made. And you can agree or disagree with them, but they're there, and they're very transparent. And I think everyone putting out estimates of the unauthorized should be as transparent as the Office of Immigration Statistics has been in the past and hopefully will be in the future. Um, so the final uh, point I want to make about and kind of getting back to to this uh, wonderful book, as I was as I was thinking the other day, what I was going to talk about, and I got to thinking about, you know, the cost of data, and how much it costs to generate a data set, or the the amount of money it takes to put a couple of sentences or a couple of questions on a government survey. You think about all the information in here, and all the effort, and all the time, and all the sweat and blood and tears people put into getting these data sources together. This represents billions and billions of dollars of efforts from across the world. And we are so, you know, even with the gaps, we are so blessed to have this resource. And um, so getting back to gaps for just one moment, all of the gaps that I've talked about today, I'm not clever. These have been talked about for years and years and years and years. And one of the reasons these, these discussions have been consistent throughout the years is, again, because data are expensive. And, and a lot of people just don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands lying around to, to toss on a few uh, questions on a CPS supplement. So in a tight budget environment, the, the question I'm going to leave with you is, how do we get more data? You know, how do we get more information? Um, I really doubt we can go to our government and say, hey, can we have a couple million or a couple billion dollars to set up a new data source and, and look at all, and, and to get this information that we want? That's probably not going to happen. We can, we are lucky to have people on the outside who are willing to pull their resources together and create other data sources. But unfortunately, that's hard for small organizations to do, even organizations as large as universities. These are, these are hard things to do because they cost a lot of money. So that leaves us with modeling with what we've got. Um, that, of course, makes me nervous because that relies, that means we have to rely on a lot of assumptions. Assumptions can be swayed, especially on a, a very politically charged time in a, in a topic that is also politically charged, I do worry about um, analysts um, making assumptions, especially when they're not very uh, forthcoming with what those assumptions are. So this leads us to uh, improvements to the data systems we already have. Maybe we could add a, add a question here. Maybe we could eventually get parental place of birth questions on the ACS. We need a data, we need a federal 
or, uh, agency to champion that, but um, I would like to see that happen someday. But there's other data systems like the systems at DHS that might be improved upon. But um, I'm sure Mark has a lot to say about this, but I'll remind people that these changes don't happen overnight. These take a lot of time. And we're not talking just 18 months. We're talking years and possibly decades to make changes to data systems in order to get in additional information out of them. And they also cost a lot of money and a lot of money over time. And where you might get one, eight, you know, one, one administration that says, sure, we'll give you, uh, you know, 1.5 million for the next 10 years to do create this data system. The following administration might say, you know, you're not gonna get that money for the next, the remaining four years which makes actually getting new data sources or new information out of old data sources very, very difficult. So I don't mean to uh, close on a, on a kind of a depressing note, but Mark will pick up um, that thought and tell us all the wonderful things that OIS is doing and DHS is doing to improve our knowledge of immigration statistics. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. That was very provocative. Thank you, and, and informative as well. And before we go to Mark, and he, he gets to tell us from what DHS is doing, um, for those of you that are on the live stream, we're going to go to questions and answers after our next speaker. For those of you that are on the live stream, um, remember, you can also ask questions by either tweeting at Migration Policy, um, or you can use the hashtag MPI Discuss, or um, send us an email at events at migrationpolicy.org. Um, my great pleasure to introduce our last speaker, Mark Rosenblum, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary and Director of the Office of Immigration Statistics at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. It's great to have someone from Homeland Security um, who's willing to engage in these conversations um, and, and cares a great deal about you know, good data getting out so that people can use it. Um, prior to DHS, uh, Mark spent five years at the Migration Policy Institute and three years at the Congressional Research Service working on some of these same issues. He was also a Council on Foreign Relations Fellow um, in the Senate, and he has a PhD from the University of California, San Diego, which is actually where we first met many years ago. Yes. So, Mark, good to have you here. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so uh, very much uh, a pleasure and an honor to be back at MPI and see uh, friendly faces um, and, uh, and an honor to be part of this panel. It's not often that I'm on a panel where I feel like I'm in the bottom half of the nerd um, <laughs> Uh, the not, specific data points, I think we have the right audience. But yes, <laughs> not the very bottom, yes. but, you know, the bottom half. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so uh, great panel, great um, great resource. I'll, I'll just um, quickly echo everything that Liz said about, you know, how important this this resource is and, and how much I would have liked to have had it when I was in graduate school and, <laughs> and um, uh, you know, certainly urge people to, to take full advantage of it. Um, so um, Jana asked me to um, first talk a little bit. So Liz, Liz has given me a long list of things to talk about. Um, but before I get to those, um, Jana asked me to talk a little bit about my perspective from having sat in, in, a, in a few different places as a data consumer and a data producer, but most of my career as a data consumer. Um, uh, and, and one of those places was here at MPI and before MPI uh, at the University of New Orleans, where I was a professor for eight years. Um, and I mean, one of the things I'm struck by generally is from the different places I've sat in government and out of government, uh, the different things that people want to do with data and the different levels of access that we have to data. So at the university and, and um, you know, as a, I'm a political scientist, um, you know, the academic research poli sci goal is really to under is to use data to understand policymaking dynamics. Why do certain policies get made? Um, it's a little bit different at, 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 at a think tank like MPI. Uh, it's more about sort of evidence-based uh, policy evaluation. And so not understanding why does policy get made, but what happens when policy gets made? What's the impact of policy? And, and through that, <clears throat> to be able to make recommendations of, well, what policy ought to get made. Um, but both of those questions, you know, approached from a quantitative perspective, um, rely very heavily on data. Um, but from both of those positions, access to data is pretty challenging um, uh, and, and, you know, less challenging with this handy dandy book. But even with this book, it's hard to get, you know, the level of granular data that you would like to, to really be able to dive in to do the kind of evidence-based, you know, policy evaluation that, that, that would allow you to, to, you know, draw stronger conclusions. Um, uh, there's a lot of great work that you can do with, you know, more like descriptive statistics. I mean, you can certainly use this to do great work, 
like most of what MPI does is is basically <clears throat> describing you know stocks and flows at you know at different levels of granularity and, and drawing conclusions from that. Um, uh, and then you know organizations like MPI also do <clears throat> also find creative solutions. You know, as as Liz said, often relying on assumptions, but you know, drawing one data, drawing from one data source to draw inferences about another one. I mean, some of MPI's work using the SIP data and and applying it to the ACS to draw inferences about coverage. You know, it's a creative way to to address the data gaps um, that that we don't have. Uh, and then the other thing that that academics and think tanks often rely on is the FOIA process. Uh, and having you know viewed that from both sides of the process now, uh, there are some real pros and cons to that. I mean, some of the best work I think that I did here at MPI relied on data that MPI actually didn't FOIA, but we got access to FOIA data working with with the New York Times. Um, and you know, having that granular data that was available through FOIA was was great. Um, but it's a very um, cumbersome process, and it's a very uncertain process. Having now sat on the other side, I can tell you that it's hard to read the mind of the person who's asking for the data. There's a lot of bureaucracy involved on the, you know, on the federal side to get, um, you know, to, to get that data cleared. So it's, you know, it's just it's it's the FOIA is not a magic wand to get great data. It's it's a tool, but but it's you know it's an imperfect tool. Um, so I think that that you know think tanks and academics. To a large degree, have sort of the 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 most um, relevant demand for data and, and the least access to it. Uh, then you know another place I've sat is on the Hill, both in in a Senate office and at the Congressional Research Service. And on the Hill, um, you're doing two things. I mean, primarily, I think there are two things that that you're looking for for data. I mean, at, at CRS, you're you're serving Hill offices, so I'll really be talking about. Um, you know what members are, are doing and, and their staffs are doing with data, and and one thing, I've, you know, without question, is sort of using data as a political tool. You know, using the data to make the political arguments you want to make um, about you know whatever the issue is. Certainly, immigration. There's there's plenty of that, um, uh, and that's all. Uh, there are also think tanks that are sort of advocacy oriented think tanks that are also all about you know using data to make. Political arguments, or to, or to make persuasive arguments um, that that you know are, are less based on policy evaluation and more based on sort of pol you know political sway. Um, but then on the Hill, I think I mean I I am certain that there is also a hunger for data for you know what I would call more I mean legitimate's the wrong word, but but for for more sort of policy um, making purposes. Uh, and certainly when you get to the point where you're writing a bill. Um, you know, and sitting around, you know, in a with with other offices trying to sort of lay out the specifics of what the bill, you know, how it's going to be structured. Um, there's a real hunger for having real policy research that that can help you craft a bill that's going to work. Um, and and uh, you know, certainly there's negotiation over what work will mean. But but once you agree on the goal of the bill, you want to you know usually draw on other people's research because Hill offices generally aren't staffed to do this. They don't really have a lot of researchers who are digging into the nitty gritty. But one of the valuable roles that that organizations like MPI and, and that academic research play is to give Hill staff the tools to to write a smart bill that's going to work. You know once they get around to doing that. Um, and um, on the Hill, you know, both at, at CRS and and in and, and a member's office, you have better access to data than you do at as, as a private in the private sector because you can call up DHS and say, "Hey, I want this data." Um, but again, having sat on both sides of that, that's also not you know, like you flip a switch and you ask for the data and you get it the next day. And I'm looking at Jill; she knows this is true now that she's on the Hill in my old office. Um, uh, in order for a Hill staffer to get data from DHS, they have to be you know, um, persistent, and they have to, you know, ask for the right data, and then ping us again, and ping us again. Uh, and it's not because we are, you know, purposely uh, being non-responsive, but it's because we get a lot of requests. Um, it's hard for us to prioritize. Um, people on the out, you know, people on the hill don't have great visibility into exactly how our data are structured, and so they're not always asking questions that we can answer or, or asking them the right way. Um, and then, you know, um, uh, it is the process of getting data cleared to make it available to the Hill is 
a cumbersome process in a large bureaucracy like DHS. Um, I mean, once OIS clears the data for you, you know, we're not just in a position to, to push it out. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's, I found it more difficult than I expected when I was on the Hill to get data from executive branch agencies. Um, and, and now that I'm in the executive branch agency, you know, that's not because it's, it's not a bad faith thing. It's just, it's, it's a hard process. Um, so then having moved to DHS, where I have the best access to data, you can imagine how excited I was having, you know, struggled for years in academia and at MPI and on the Hill, all of a sudden I'm going to be in this incredible data rich environment. Uh, and that's sort of true, but, um, it's still a challenge. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and one reason it's a challenge is that our data systems are, are highly imperfect uh, and they are highly siloed. When DHS was created, pulling together 22 different agencies, each of those agencies had multiple data systems that, you know, had evolved, you know, in sort of a path dependent, like totally siloed way. And nothing really changed when they were all under one, you know, secretary. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I had done before arriving at DHS, um, I think it was Doris and I and Randy Capps met, I don't know, like eight or 10 years ago with Don Szymanski at the Office of Immigration Statistics to try to put together what in my mind was sort of a pipeline or a life cycle model to understand how somebody, you know, after they were apprehended and then detained by ICE and then went before Eeyore and then were deported to sort of trace that through the process and to be able to report on cohorts, you know, all of these people who were apprehended in this sector, what happened to them? And John told us, you know, the data really aren't structured that way. And I thought he was just being difficult. And it turns out the data really aren't structured that way. Um, and in the two years I've been at DHS, we have been working, you know, it was like one of my very first priorities was to like finally do this. And we're getting close. We're getting very close, but it's still not done. It's uh, it's a lot of work, um, and it's it's work because uh, the components own the data, and they like owning their own data, and they're not committed to this project necessarily in the same way that that headquarters is. Uh, it's work because it is be, because the data systems are not structured the same way. It involves assumptions, and it's not, you know the, even when we all put our good faith effort into it. It's going to be a complicated process that that everybody has to sort of agree on the methodology, um, uh, and then there's that same sort of bureaucratic struggle of pushing things through the clearance process and, and just making make making headway on it. Um, so um, you know uh, it's not easy, um, but but in the you know I think in the executive branch we have sort of the same uses of data that that the Hill does. You know there are certainly you know, political appointees in any administration who are, are interested in how the data can support their political goals. And, and there is a drive to learn from the data to, you know, to make better policy and to, you know, to make effective policy. Um, that, you know, sort of the, the evidence-based policymaking, you know, using data to inform policy and, and to be smarter. Um, it's, I, I think that, um, that, to a certain degree, government bureaucracies are not well structured to do that, um, partly because, um, or, or our political system is not super well structured to do that, partly because to, to do that kind of analysis really takes a lot of time and effort. It's the, you know, I mean, the, the, the researchers in this room know that, that, you know, writing a good report that is analytic and that uses data to assess policy, I mean, that's, it takes months or years of, of, of sustained effort. And the, the policy questions that come up in government, when they come up, you want to answer tomorrow. Um, so you really have to um, anticipate what the questions will be far in advance and target the resources at them in a sustained way that, like Liz said, you know, with, with, with political change and, and with pressing priorities, it's not always possible to carve out the time that you need to do that successfully. And then you get these urgent questions that come up and you want to give a, a, an analytic evidence-based answer to them. And, and you know, um, we're not really designed or staffed uh, with resources to do sort of quick turn, you know, um, analysis um, in the way that, uh, you know, certain, certain outside research organizations that are, you know, messaging organizations that can quickly, you know, use the data to, to, to produce a, an answer. It's not really the model that, that we're built on. Um, but, but I do think that, um, 
I mean, one of my goals uh, at, at OIS is to is to increase DHS's capacity to, to do that kind of research. And we have some long-term research projects, including this life cycle project that I mentioned, uh, and 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 doing well. I'll say more about uh, I'll, I'll say more about some of the projects that we're working on. But um, so that's sort of my three perspectives from the places I've sat. Um, I, I know that we're sort of running way over time, so let me quickly talk about what what we're working on now um, and what our what our priorities are. So we sort of have four main lines of work. Um, one is uh, our core reports that that Liz has referenced and that this this uh, data guide is full of our yearbook, our flow reports, our population estimates. Um, starting last year, for the first time, we began releasing some quarterly reports on the benefit side. Uh, this year, we hope to begin releasing quarterly enforcement reports, um, and that's uh, partly increasing our technical capacity and partly, you know, just sort of establishing the political support to do that. Um, we are also, so another goal for this year, some of you know, some of you don't know, my office uh, before I got there went from 20 statisticians to two statisticians, uh, and we've, we're still in the process of building back up to, to full strength. Uh, but we are trying to get back on our sort of traditional publishing schedule. So the 2017 yearbook should be hitting your mailboxes uh, this summer instead of, you know, next spring. Um, so uh, look forward to that. Uh, and one of our big goals this year is to um, update our population estimate methodologies. Um, and, and it will address some of the things that Liz brought up as part of our update of the LPR population estimate. We hope to um, produce a refugee and asylum population estimate uh, for the first time. Um, uh, as Liz said, I mean, there's a lot of assumptions. I mean, on one level, all those, you know, they're, they're pretty simple demographic models. But, you know, given data limitations, there's a lot of work that goes into addressing, you know, the, the sort of handful of unknowns. And, and, to, and, and, and we're very concerned about doing it as right as we can and being as transparent as we can um, for all the reasons that Liz said. Um, uh, so, um, so a second big priority for OIS is what we call the Immigration Data Integration Initiative. Uh, and I have Michelle Steinmetz, my uh, program manager for that effort, is here today. Um, and basically, um, that is an effort to address all those challenges I spoke about a minute ago to, to, um, for those four dozen or so separate DHS immigration data systems to produce common data standards, to link the records at the individual person-centric level, to put them all into a, a common data environment, you know, so the bottom line will be that there will be a single authoritative source of, of immigration data that anybody in the department can go there and, and ask, you know, whatever, how many H-1Bs from India in, you know, this state or how many uh, people were apprehended in this sector and, and, and deported or whatever, uh, and everybody would get the same answer. Um, and because the records would be linked, it would be much easier to do all of that evidence-based analysis that, that is hard to do now. So that's that's my grand project. It will be it will transform DHS data like fundamentally, um, and uh, it turns out that that's hard to do also. Um, uh, um, trying to be difficult. What's that? I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm trying to be good, and it's hard. Um, but but it you know it will transform the way we report on data, the speed and the comprehensiveness and the accuracy of our reporting. It will it will have operational uh, implications, you know, for operational research, and it'll and it'll completely transform what kind of analysis we can do. Um, so um, that that project got started in September of 2016, shortly before the transition, um, and um, uh, it's it's um, it is not yet funded because it was started after the 2017 budget request was done. So we have lots of challenges. We can talk more about it if y'all want. Uh, but, but, but you know, hopefully we'll continue to make progress on that this year. We definitely made some good progress. And then I'll just quickly, um, uh, since we're, I know, again, that we're over time, let me just quickly um, talk about my other, my other big project, or my, one of my other big concerns is to increase immigration data transparency. Um, and um, what I mean by that is to increase the number of, of data sets that we make available and to make them more granular, um, to put data out in more formats that's more, that, that are more accessible to a wider range of people. Um, and uh, I mean, mostly those two things, mostly to make the data, more data, more available to more people. And I'll just quickly um, 
show you a couple things. We have begun putting a lot of data in our, um, in our OIS reading room. So if you haven't found the reading room yet, I encourage you to go there. I think that they cited in, in, in the guide, but it's got lots of, I mean, it's actually not a huge number of data sets. It's got, we've got about a, maybe eight or 10 data sets up here, but um, they are basically much more granular views of existing yearbook tables. So, you know, if the yearbook table, if the, the, there's, there's a yearbook table on how many non-immigrants by class of admission and another yearbook table on how many non-immigrants by um, country of citizenship, in the reading room, we've got non-immigrants by class of admission by country of citizenship. Um, so it, it's, it's a ton more data. So go in there and look around. Um, and I will also point you to, this is a brand new thing, unveiled today for the first time. Um, we have a data directory up here uh, because uh, to make it easier for y'all to find it, I mean, it, 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 you can click on the different types of, of uh, immigrant, you know, of, of immigrant and non-immigrant categories and see all the different things that, that we offer on it and get pointers to them. So hopefully this will make it easier for you to find, you know, the, the, the numerous resources we make available. So uh, go to the data directory. It's the last link on our homepage. So, so go there. My goals for the next year, hopefully, is to begin putting micro data on our website, anonymized micro data, so that y'all can do real research or you know even even more um, sophisticated research. And then um, we'd love to do something a little bit like um, the American Fact Finder or the Data Hub, where we have interactive data sets that that make it you know much easier for sort of less sophisticated users to to produce sort of custom um, spreadsheets. So uh, those are those are things that we we'd like to accomplish. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention that we have a huge immigration research agenda also. In addition to the life cycle stuff, we're doing a lot of work on, on border security and we're doing work on immigrant recidivism um, uh, and, and trying to, to build up our capacity to you know, make the department smarter. Um, and some of that has been, so, so just to address a couple of Liz's points, uh, the data integration initiative, um, so we've been focusing on the enforcement life cycle. We are also doing work on the benefits life cycle, which will address all those you know, adjustments and, and be able to trace people better through. Uh, CBP has already made a lot of progress on that um, through its ATIS uh, data set, which is what they use to do the overstay, uh, the entry exit overstay analysis. Um, we can talk more about that, but basically they are doing a similar effort to link uh, CBP and USCIS data in order to, to see Somebody who didn't leave, is it because they didn't leave because they adjusted or because they overstayed? And, and the department has made some real progress there. Um, so I'll, I'll um, stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, this is, we're a little bit over time, but, the, but I think you will agree that that was worth it. Some really great presentations. Um, we're going to go until 12.35. We're going to take an extra five minutes. You have to leave at 12.30. Obviously, feel free to get up and leave at 12.30. But we will go to 12.35, and that will give us 20 minutes for Q&A or a chance for you to ask some questions. We're going to start with people in this room. But a reminder to folks that are on the live stream, which is, is an even larger group than those that are here, by the way, um, on the live stream that you can tweet questions to us at, at Migration Policy. You can use the hashtag MPI Discuss, or you can email to events at migrationpolicy.org. We already have a couple of the questions that came through Twitter. We'll get to those in a second. But first, let's go to hands in the room. Anyone here have a question? Or you've been so amazed by the panelists that it's all been explained. Uh, hand up right here. And if you can give us your name, um, your affiliation, and a very quick question. Uh, hi, my name is Becky Wells, and I'm an attorney with Legal Aid Justice Center. So um, we're maybe a group that you didn't mention is using this data, but is very interested in it. Um, and I have a question about FOIA data. Um, so we often get the data we need through FOIA because it's more specific than sort of the general data available. Do you have any um, sort of advice about the most effective way to think about how to ask for data given the way that it's currently structured? Hold on to the answer for a second. We'll take a round of questions and then we'll, we'll come back. Let me do one here and then we'll do a couple of the Twitter questions. 
Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I'm Hannah Warner. I'm a law fellow with Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. And my question regards um, relates to processing times for different types of visas. So I can see on page 10, um, there's a very helpful link to uh, data from USCIS um, regarding uh, processing times and results for the Form I-130. And I'm wondering if any of you could point me to resources for other sorts of visa types or for, um, say, for instance, um, application, or sorry, um, Form I-485, which would be step two of the process after the Form I-130. Um, I'm happy to clarify this question later if need be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me give you one of the questions, two, actually a couple questions that came through email. Um, both from uh, Omar Kebe from the Commerce Department uh, across town here. Uh, number one, is there any good data set on U.S. residents or citizens who are living abroad by country? And two, a question specifically to Dr. Rosenblum, does DHS publish counts of H-2A and H-2B visa holders who renew their visas while in the United States? Essentially, those who have been issued visas by the State Department and arrive in the U.S. and decide to extend their visa by applying with U USCIS. Other questions from the room here? I actually have a question. You have a question, yes. Jana. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, you mentioned that uh, you, you guys published a report about why we should not use ACS for recent uh, immigrants. Yes. What would you recommend to, to use, or, or shall we just yeah. okay. let that sleeping dog lie? <laughs> 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 Thank you. One more hand. Seeing no hands, let me go one more question that came in by email from Emily Kephart at Kind. The TVPRA requires an annual report by DOS HHS on unaccompanied alien children returns and repatriations. These reports were happening regularly until 2011. Has anyone seen this report more recently than 2011 and can you advise on how to access it? Okay, Julie. I'll save time. Julie Sugarman here from MPI. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mark, you were uh, talking about um, resolving the differences between the different data sets. Does any of that involve the way that questions are asked out in the field? Or is there any difference in you know how data is collected that won't you won't be able to resolve it because it's uh, you know just two the, the underlying data are too different? Go back to the panel, Mark. You have a, a whole bunch, and then we'll go to others here. Go down um, the line. So to Julie's question, yes. Um, I mean, you know, it's not really about how, I mean, I, I wouldn't phrase it as how questions are asked. I would phrase it as what data are collected because, you know, most of our data come from forms that, that, that officers and agents fill out either when they're, you know, apprehending somebody or, or, or processing them for removal or, or processing a benefit application. So, you know, um, they fill out, usually paper forms, sometimes online forms, and, and there are a lot of data questions that, that we might be interested in that the officer doesn't collect, you know, doesn't ask. So, yeah, I guess it doesn't ask, but... Um, uh, yeah, so but, yeah, and that as well. So, um, so I mean, this, is, this has been, I mean, just, you know, in the, in the world that or the, the subset of the data that, that I've spent most of my career thinking about, um, you know, uh, which is uh, sort of the, the enforcement side and, and um, under, when, when, uh, when the previous secretary, or the previous, when Jay Johnson, you know, uh, established enforcement priorities and said, we're only going to, you know, focus our, we're going to primarily, we're going to, we're going to focus our enforcement efforts on people in certain categories and not on people in other categories. You know, the department had no way to measure which category you were in because, you know, that hadn't been a priority before, so, so nobody was collecting those data. So it was a huge effort for the department, for, you know, for ICE to begin measuring, you know, recording, is somebody a priority or not? Um, and, and, uh, and it took, you know, it took the better part of a couple of years to set up that system to collect those data and, and thereby to implement the policy. Um, so it's just one example. But, but, you know, so we couldn't, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people were or weren't Johnson priorities before that because we weren't collecting the data I and mean, we can estimate it. Um, so, um, so that's, yes. Uh, on the UAC removals and returns, um, 
I um, have to admit that I was not aware of a specific TVPRA reporting um, uh, requirement under that, so I'll, I'll look for that. Um, I'm sure that that the that that Emily knows that um, CB, CBP puts a lot of data on its website about UAC apprehensions and UAC inadmissibilities, um, but UAC doesn't track those people through the system to be able to report on their removals and returns. ICE doesn't really systematically track UACs, so. This is an example of the kind of thing that 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 we are developing a better capacity to report on. We are not currently producing that report yet, but but it's something that that we should be able to report on. Um, so uh, I will look for that reporting requirement, and I'll add that to my um, list of reasons why we should be doing this work. Um, on H two A and H two B renewals, um, and also on visa processing time. Um, I'm so so OIS does uh, a lot of reporting on on. Um, on data that span multiple DHS components and on enforcement data. On data that are like purely benefit side, USCIS data, we were, USCIS does great reporting. I should have given them a shout out before. And I will confess that I am not an expert on all of the things that are up on USCIS's website. And, and, and so, so there are some USCIS people in the room if they want to jump up and say whether there's, um, you know, whether we report on H-2A, H-2B renewals and on um, 485 visa processing time. Um, yes on both? Yeah, well, no. <laughs> so the 45 visa processing time, uh, this was actually the subject of a recent OIG report just published in the last week, and USCIS provided a response. OIG pointed out the processing times currently on the website are not particularly accurate and uh, advised us to make some changes there. And USCIS's response was... Um, concur with the recommendation. We've begun testing a new method of determining processing times from our systems. So the goal is to be able to post them within one to two weeks instead of the current six weeks and redesigning the web pages and hope to roll that out by December 31st this year. Yes, uh, Andrew Parker, Office of Policy and Strategy at USCIS. Great, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Um, Liz. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Mark may have something to say also about FOIA, but one of the things I can I can I can only encourage people who do put in FOIA requests to be as specific as possible with their request. I mean, some of the requests I've seen at census is pretty much like, can you give us all the information about immigration you guys have? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, so you get these in enormous, you know, requests that can't be filled. So the, just from my experience, I'm, I probably don't have as much experience with FOIA requests as Mark does, um, be as specific as you possibly can be. Um, and then hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll work out. This is, this is not he easy. To, as someone who's been on the other side of these requests, these aren't always easy requests to complete because people will put in very general statements and general requests, and it's really difficult to figure out what, what the person wants, and you just sort of give them what you think they want, and it's not always, doesn't always work. So be as specific as possible with your requests. Um, as far as the, um, the listener who asked for the uh, good data sets of, U of US uh, citizens abroad, no, there is not, and I doubt there ever will be. The uh, federal government knows how many military are overseas, they know how many um, of their employees are overseas, like State Department employees. But if I go overseas and live in France for 10 years, I have no requirement to go to the embassy and check in. You know, you know if I go, you know, I'm a student in Italy for three months, I, there's no requirement for me to go and check in. There's no way to know how comprehensively how many U.S. citizens are abroad. There's just not. Uh, we've fought that battle at the Census Bureau numerous times. It'll come up again, I'm sure, in the future, and the, then the answer will be the same. Um, also, with, uh, as, as far as using the ACS to estimate new arrivals, unfortunately, when you have data sets that are collected over, over a period of a year, it just mucks up our ability to give a good estimate of the size of the new arrivals. Mm -hmm. So it's just we just don't have one. We really just don't have one. And that's an unfortunate data gap. But if you wait a year, if you're willing to lag, mm -hmm. you can get... So if you use 2015 data, you can get the 2016 estimate of new arrivals. You just can't get the 2017 estimate from that data set. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Jonathan, do you want to jump in?
Uh, jump in on the on the question about estimates of U.S. citizens abroad. So, uh, very little information. As, as Liz po pointed out, if you go and live abroad, uh, if you register with the embassy for whatever reason, you, know, you might want to be stay connected with you uh, with, the, with the embassy. They will keep track of you. If you move to another country and won't re-register, then okay, you 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 might be still living in France, whereas you are in, in Morocco. Um, however, the, the Department of Estimate, I'm sorry, the Department of State, uh, started publishing uh, occasionally reports. So there is one I mentioned on page 19. It's called uh, Consular Affairs by Numbers, and it has an estimate of the number of U.S. citizens living abroad. And it looks like the data are updated annually, so at least maybe not char detailed characteristics, but at least you have general sense of the number of people. Um, we'll have to get more information about them, the assumptions, because uh, because estimates are always sensitive to assumptions, as Liz pointed out. Um, the UN Population Division that uh, collects information from different countries' statistical agencies and then cross-tabulates the information, started publishing um, uh, a bilateral migration table that basically shows how many people from you know, all of the countries reside in in all of the countries. So it's basically by destination country and by origin. So using that uh, table, it's just an Excel table, uh, again, you can at least get, get a sense of uh, the number of um, U.S. born persons, not necessarily U.S. citizens, because that would include naturalized mm -hmm. citizens. Uh, how many U.S. born people reside you know, in other countries? Just looked at the most recent 2017 data uh, and um, Mexico is number one, where people, U.S. born reside, followed by Canada and the U.K. Um, and we have a map on, on the uh, Data Hub, thanks to, to G and um, uh, a few other colleagues, uh, that visually shows you just select the country of origin and it will show you where the destinations and the other way around. So check it out. Thank Mark, you. do you have anything to add on this round? Or should we go to another round here? Keep going. Keep going. Okay, <laughs> we have seven minutes. Um, we're going to try and end exactly at 12.35. Any more questions from the room? I've got a couple Twitter questions, but anyone who has a burning question in the room, please raise your hand. Wow, you've gotten the information you need. This is good. <laughs> Let, let's go to Twitter then quickly, which is um, a question uh, from Sylvia Rusin uh, from World Education Services uh, from Mark. Will the new immigration data integration initiative have data on educational attainment uh, for non-citizens? Will be education levels be broken down by visa categories and or LPRs, refugees, asylees, et cetera? A question also from Sahira Barajas. Um, how is the country of origin for an authorized estimated? Um, and Sarah Letson from the Immigrant Legal Resource Center asked about how can nonprofits connect with graduate students and others um, to help with immigrant immigration data projects. I'm not sure that's something this, this panel can answer, but putting it out there. Mm. Anyone, this is the last opportunity, anyone here have a question for the panel or a comment they want to make? Yes, over here. Tori Johnson, American Immigration Council. Uh, going back to FOIA quickly, I was just curious about any uh, comprehensive uh, resources that pull together um, existing FOIA um, requests, data, data sets um, that have been released publicly um, through FOIA. I know that DHS has their FOIA library, um, but that it's really just a search bar by term. It's not organized systematically. We have one more question um, by Twitter, actually, from Madeline Chasen, who asks, um, how will federal offices, ACS and DHS, work to collect accurate data about immigrants and refugees at a time when many are increasingly scared to report their status, origin, et cetera? What steps are your organizations taking to assuage those fears? And thanks for the great panel and report. Oh. Oh. Anyone else? We go back to our panel. Going, going, gone. Okay, good. We'll start at this end, um, Mark, and then we'll work our way back to the on this end. Do you seem to have a well, Mark, just, any final thoughts? Here? Just one uh, related to that last question around the fear of uh, responding. There is a, uh, you may have know about the proposed question to add uh, 
and a new immigration question to the decennial census, 2020 census. So um, there are pretty serious concerns about that in terms of uh, what that would do to, that we already have certain hard to count populations. If you add a question about immigration, um, it's gonna be much more harder to count so many of those groups. So um, we're worried if, if that were to happen, obviously um, census data, it's not just important because of congressional redistricting and the, the allocation of funds, but also because we need those good census data for the ACS and the CPS. So we, we need a good starting point in 2020 because it's used for population estimates and for a sampling frame throughout the decade. So uh, we hope that doesn't happen, but um, that's one thing that we can do is to prevent questions like that being added uh, to surveys that will prevent people from responding. Uh, survey response is already on its way down. So uh, that would just make it all the more difficult if we start to add things like that to our forms. Thank you. Okay. Uh, to pick up on um, Mark's comment about the uh, addition of the citizenship question to the 2020 census, again, this would be uh, a question on whether or not you're a citizen or non-citizen. It would not ask legal status. Um, there is no evidence to suggest that um, the citizenship question affects the response rate for the American Community Survey. Remember, the American Community Survey is part of the decennial census. Also, things to think about. Um, I know there's a bit of doom and gloom about the um, possibility of adding that to the decennial census, but there are three. Uh, if it is added, there are three possible benefits that we have to adding it to the 2020 census. Initially, of course, we have additional data. We all love data. I love more data. I would love to have uh, the uh, citizen non-citizenship non -citizenship data down to the lowest levels of geography. I think that'd be wonderful for researchers to do all sorts of cool stuff with. Uh, second, uh, remember if it's on the 2020 census, it can be used as a final population weight for the ACS, thus stabilizing the estimates of the, of the former population in the um, ACS as well. And then finally, if it is on the 2020 census, we can actually develop um, estimates of coverage of the foreign-born population, because if it's on the census, we can include it on the post-enumeration surveys that are done after every uh, decennial census. And the only way you can get coverage is to have a question on the 2020 census and in the post-enumeration survey. So if we had citizenship on the 2020 census, we would actually have really solid estimates of coverage, and that would go back to definitive proof of whether or not adding this question would actually impact the estimates of the foreign-born population instead of it being just an assumption, which many people have. Um, also, um, as far as estimating the country of the, uh, when somebody asked um, how do we estimate the country of origin of the unauthorized, in the unauthorized estimates, the unauthorized estimates is pretty much an accounting method where you take two data sources. You take the data source, which is the um, census data source, which gives you um, characteristics of the foreign-born population, including their country of birth and their country of citizenship, no, excuse me, country of birth. And then you subtract it, the um, estimates of the legal permanent resident population derived from the administrative data source, and that gives you what's called the residual, and that is what people assume to be the unauthorized population. So the information about country of origin of the, in the unauthorized estimates actually is, comes from the census data used in the, um, produce the estimates. Thanks. Mark? Um, so then the, the last two points I'll make, uh, somebody asked about, will the IDII, the Data Integration Initiative, cover educational attainment? So um, our ambition is for this to be a US government-wide effort. Um, and we are pretty synced up with the Department of Justice and the Department of Labor and, and HHS and State Department. Um, uh, we are less synced up with census uh, because of census's, you know, uh, uh, protections and, and, and limits on how they share data. So uh, not anytime soon is the answer to that question. Um, and, uh, and, and then I would love to see a comprehensive, like every data set that's ever been FOIA'd website. Somebody should write a grant and do that for sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, I, I haven't looked at it in a while, but back when I used to look at it, the ICE, ICE had a FOIA library that, that I thought was pretty 
you know that that had a lot of data sets on it, not just a search bar. So if you if you I don't know if you know that one, but that that's a good one to look at. Um, Thank I'll you. stop there. Um, to, congratulations to, to the authors, to Jana and Michelle. Particularly, we're here. Uh, immigration data matters. Use it; it's chock full of, of really good data sources. Um, the the name is obviously also a play on on words. Not only is it filled with data matters, but it also the subtext of this is the data actually do matter. Um, there's a lot of talk about a post truth society. We do not think we live in a post truth society. We think we live in a society where people care to have actual data and good analysis on the issues that they care most about. And hopefully, this is one of those tools that will help people really be able to access good information and make their own conclusions about what they think on key issues. Um, thank you to our panelists. A round of applause for a fabulous panel.